right. Well, um, before we pray, I just want to mention a few things. Um, I, I didn't wear a jacket this morning. I wore short sleeves because I knew it was going to be super hot. And uh, we are excited about having hot dogs and fellowshipping afterwards. Uh, it's one of the things that we do, you know, in kind of things in times like this that the times when we sing or we take communion are kind of the really spiritual moments. Um, but actually all of it is, are things that the Lord blesses and that the Lord uses in times when we connect face-to-face with each other and we have to have conversation are really important. And today is a, it's a heavy topic. It's an important topic. We're going to talk about lust and adultery. I sent an email out ahead of time to the church just to let you know if you have your kids with you. And I'll be sensitive about how I say things, but it's just the nature of the topic. It's also something that um, can produce a deep amount of shame in people as, as sin is exposed, as we talk about um, the weight of our actions and our lives. And so in your, on your handout, there's a QR code in the back. And the reason we put that there is when you follow that link, there's actually kind of a separate, a separate section for men and for women. Um, but we have different groups that meet. We have sexual integrity groups that meet about addiction to pornography. We have a marriage workshop that's coming up. We have different things that are happening, but some of them are not happening right now. They might be happening in a few months. But there's, sometimes it's just important to be able to take a step of obedience, to reach out, to ask for help, to say, hey, I need to be a part of that um, right now rather than uh, wait for two or three months. So just being able to respond right away. And so if there's a way in which you need help or follow up from the things we talked about this morning, want to just call your attention to that QR code, give you an immediate way in which you can take a step and respond, even if it's something that we are doing uh, maybe a few months from now. We wanted to give you a way to respond. But also as we have lunch uh, together, and we're just interacting with each other. We're going to have a time of ministry time afterwards. In fact, um, we're going to kind of quietly dismiss you guys as you go, um, just so if anybody wants prayer afterwards, they're able to do that. And the great thing is, is instead of what normally happens here, where we kind of all talk and, and stay in this room for a long time, we can, we can immediately exit out and go have hot dogs together and just eat and fellowship. But when we do that, I just want you to know right here on the start that that time is meant to be a time to build you up, to encourage you, to strengthen you. It's a time that God blesses. And so um, just keep that in mind. And uh, let's just take a moment and pray. And we're going to ask the Lord to speak uh, through the preaching of his word. And let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, for revealing yourself today already in, in different ways. Thank you that your desire is to conform us into your image. And we want that to happen through our time sitting before your word. We thank you that your word is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. Thank you that your word exposes us. It reveals who we really are. It reveals who you are. And we want to behold you today. We want to see you for who you are. And we pray for anyone who is um, just ensnared in sin today, or anyone who is far from you, any marriage that is being disrupted right now, Lord, that you would come and you would bring healing and life. You would draw people to yourself. Thank you that as even as we pray, Lord, we, we can look around the room as we celebrate these new members that came in. We can look around the room and we can give testimony to the fact that there are people in this room that have been rescued, that we have been rescued from death into life, that there are people in this room that have had their marriages on the brink of complete destruction and have been restored back to life. Thank you for people that have been ensnared in sin and addiction that you have brought rescue and freedom and deliverance to. And so we go before your word humbly and we go before your word with faith today. And we look to you as the giver of life. And we love you. We thank you for this time you've given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we jump in, as I said, it's a, a heavy subject, so not a lot of, there's not going to lie, a bit of a lot of jokes or funny things. It's just the nature of the topic. But one of the reasons why we why we give ourselves to the preaching of God's word through passages of scriptures, it forces us to deal with difficult topics. And so we're going to talk about this today in two weeks from now. So Chris is going to share next week and for Father's Day. Um, and then two weeks from now, I'll kind of do really what will end up being a part two of this on, on marriage and divorce and remarriage. And, and as we talk about these difficult things, we're doing it because this is what Jesus taught us. So we're in, a, we're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, which is really the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be an apprentice of Jesus and to follow him with our lives. Jesus is giving what it looks like to be a part of his kingdom on the earth. 
And he's giving us the way in which, what, what it looks like to access his life. So really, before, if we could just think of before us, is the path that leads to death or is a path that leads to life? And Jesus is highlighting the road, the way that leads to life. Um, Stephanie, who's right here in the third row, she's, she's from El Salvador. She just came up and shared with me. And I, I just wanted to, to share this with you because we just, we just baptized her a few weeks ago. So if you weren't here, I would go back and watch that on the live stream because she talked about uh, even her family in El Salvador was watching as we were baptizing her and just, ex- just proclaiming new life in Christ. And she came up to me during the break time and she said, she's like, I just feel like this verse is for the church today. And uh, it's a verse that, that some of us who've grown up in the church are really familiar with. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And I just wanted to pass that on from our sister who's new in Christ. And, and she just came and she said, I believe as we were praying, this was something that the Lord wanted to say to the church today. And I would just hold up to you. That's what it is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a putting aside. Our life in Christ is about putting aside our own way of living and trusting him with all of our hearts and following after his ways because it's the way that leads to life. And what we're going to see as we just kind of unpack this for a few minutes is that the ways that we are tempted might change. So the ways that we are tempted towards lust might change because the environments have changed because of, uh, you know, because of modernity, because of the times in which we live. The, the ways in which we're tempted might have changed, but, and, but the temptations themselves are timeless. But combined with those temptations, the truth that Jesus gives us the life that he gives us and the invitation to walk in that life is also timeless, and it's powerful. I was reading these last few weeks. Uh, it, was, it was actually just this last week, in the, in the last maybe nine or ten days, a New York Times article. It was talking about how the Internet has gone to these remote places. In this case, it was talking about the remote, these remote places of the Amazon jungle, and it was talking about this one tribe, tribe, the Marubo tribe, the, the Marubo village, uh, the Marubo people. It's 2,000 people. It's talking about how this uh, satellite internet came nine months ago, and it was talking about the, the ramifications of that. And so I need to just get this picture because they, they, they talked about nine months of satellite inter- internet, and this interview is happening. So the, the two reporters that went, these were these white reporters going into this, uh, this jungle, this Amazon jungle. They're, they're sitting down with some of the villagers, and they're sitting down with this woman who is crushing berries, and she's putting, it's the berries they use to, to, to put on this face paint, this tribal face paint that they, that they use. So I just want you to get that picture in your mind. They had to hike over 50 miles. It means people are like in the middle of nowhere. But for the last nine months, they've had access to the internet, and it's provided them a way to communicate in case of you know, uh, an emergency. It's allowed them the opportunity to learn things that they wouldn't have learned. But it's also brought with it all the things we can imagine the internet brought. Social media, violent video games, and as we are talking about today, pornography. And this is what it says. This is what the, the author writes about this interaction with this lady, as you have this in your mind. She says, young people have gotten lazy because of the internet, she said. They're learning the ways of the white people. Then she paused and added, but please don't take our internet away. <laughs> she says, here's, here's the, the result is that there's been this, this real downside, laziness, addiction, all these things have come, but please don't take this away from us. As you think about that, I want you to, I want you to have that in view, that you have this new temptation given these people that are on the other you know, the other side of the world from us that might seem completely removed, completely disconnected from us, and yet have the exact same temptations. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. They were trying to narrow, the people were trying to narrow their definition of sexual purity. They were trying to define it as it's just about physical adultery, physical infidelity. And Jesus takes that narrow definition and he explains the heart of the law. He's already done this. John took us through this passage last week. He's done this with anger. He's saying, you commit murder with your words. 
it's not just about you physically kill killing people, it's about you committing murder with your words. And then he says this, it's not just about physical sexual sin, it's about committing adultery in your hearts and in your minds. So we want to just start as a ba baseline just of the importance of marriage and sex. Uh, marriage is a covenant that is based on a forever promise. It points to Christ and his church. So it's something physical here in this life that represents something that is universal, that is forever. It is the commitment between Christ and his church, and it is one man and one woman forever. And what marriage, what this covenant does is it, number one, it is for the glory of God. It's to image him. It's to reflect him. The second thing is it, it produces the gift of children. So it's where we get this call to be fruitful and multiply, and we have the gift of children. And, and lastly, we would just hold up that this, that this gift that is meant to bring life to the world is something that brings us great joy. Now, we know in that, and we don't even have to survey the room, that we've been affected by sin. And so in our bodies, in the fallen nature, you know, people have the desire to have children and, and can't. And so we, we, we pray for and we, we, you know, we ask God for opening of wombs for people who've, who, who are struggling with infertility. So we know we, we, we deal with the, the, the essence of our fallen nature in that way. We know that, again, we don't even have to go around the room and pull to know how much we have been affected by broken marriages. Some of you are in the very, you're in the very thick of that right now. But marriage, as God has designed it to be, is something that is meant to reflect him, to image him, and sex is intended to reinforce that oneness. It's two becoming one. It's saying to someone with your body what you are saying with your life, which is everything that I have belongs to you. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 7 that our bodies as husband and wife belong to each other. And that is why sex outside of that covenant is destructive. And that's how, sin, that's how the scriptures describe it. And I want to just stop for a moment. I, was, I had this great moment, again, we, as we prayed for the new members. I was with the new members class, and we were talking about the reality of being born again. And the fruit of that being born again and being made new by Jesus is that we want to live like him. We want to reflect him. Now, we, don't always, we aren't always faithful to do that. But that being born again and being made new like him produces that in us, a desire to be like him. And I would say that to you because there are people in here that are searching. You're asking questions. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And we just say to you as we hold this up that, that we're, not, we're not pressing on this, this law on you to obey because you have no ability to obey it apart from Christ making you new. And God sending his spirit inside of you. And so... That's your step number one. Your step number one is to be made new by him. And then you have the ability to be obedient to him. But as we gather to teach, we're talking to the church here. This is a gathering of the church. It's a gathering of the family of God. And we're talking about these very difficult things because oftentimes we don't do what we're supposed to do. We don't walk in the ways of Jesus. And so sex outside of covenant is destructive, but we find ways to talk about it and describe it in ways that even kind of feels a little bit more palatable. So we describe it as things like premarital sex. Like this is something that you do before, like this is something that's happening, like it's on the way to marriage in some way. The scripture describes that word, it uses a hard word, it's called fornication. We want to feel the weight of that, that it is, that sex outside of marriage is in essence, it's destructive. And Why? Because you're giving of yourself, you're being naked outside of covenant, outside of a, out of a promise that is forever. I read an article once that was talking, it was a secular article that was talking about this. It was talking about people living together before they're married. And this person was saying, I feel like that, I'm, that it's like a job interview. It's like I'm constantly producing a resume on how good I am, on how good I perform, on what I put out. It's not what sex was intended to do. It's intended to be within the covenant of marriage, within a promise. In the essence, it's again displaying on the outside what has taken place on the inside that we belong to each other. And for a husband and wife to do that, it's going back, it's pointing back to the Garden of Eden when it says that Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. 
And it's an incredible picture to think of what God wants to do with us in renewing us. Because oftentimes when we think of areas related to sex, there is so much shame associated with it. But it's intended to be an act of covenant renewal. Like when we talk about consummating marriage, we're talking about two becoming one flesh. We're saying, yes, you, you came before, you know, a pastor. You came before someone that, that, is, that is praying over you. And you made these vows before God and before people. And you, you know, expressed this. But what, what happened when you come together? You consummate the marriage. You're coming together to become one is that that's intended to be something that reinforces the covenant over and over and over again. It's saying with your body is what you're saying with your life. All of me is for you. And so a little later in the passage, that Colossians, that Jackie read, you should talk about the Jesus being the image of the invisible God. I mean, Paul's writing to this, these people that have been rescued by God, and he's talking about this desire for, for God to form us into the image of Christ. And then he gives us a way to do it. And actually, on the back of your handout, I give you kind of a little uh, how to work through Colossians 3 because if you go verse by verse through it, it's just a great way of, of renewing your mind. And you can do it together with your home group or with your spouse, with your, with your kids. But I'm just going to give you a few verses from that, Colossians chapter 3. Again, writing to believers, it says, if, you, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things, for you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So he's describing this nature that we have. Our life is hidden with Christ and God, and this is what he says. Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. And then the very first thing he says is sexual immorality impurity, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. He's saying, put these things to death. So your life is hidden with Christ. You've been given this new life, but you have to choose to, to set your mind on Christ. You have to choose as the people of God to put to death this old nature that is not supposed to be part of you anymore. That's the process of being conformed into the image of Christ. And so what it is for us is, as he ends, he says, which is idolatry? And we need to understand that idolatry is something that can take on all kinds of forms. We can have all kinds of ways in which we try to uh, put people or things in the place where only God can be. We make good things ultimate things. And it's really helpful when we know the our own proclivity, the way that we are own uniquely wired and tempted to sin. Like when I think of, 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 of sins like people that, that, that given to alcohol addiction or drugs or eating too much, people who are given to, to laziness or to overworking. I mean, you think of all the different things that we could do. Like in this particular area, I'm much more tempted. I have to be much more guarded in my heart in the area of lust than I have in the area of alcohol. But regardless of what it is for you, regardless of what that area is for you that, you have to, that, you're, that you're aware of, and it might be multiple things, and again, these are things that affect all of us. It is saying to us as the people of God, Colossians 3, put to death those things that are earthly in you. And so Jesus says, if you look at a woman, and it applies to women to man as well, if you look at a man with lustful intent, this word lust it's in, the, in the Greek translations of the Old Testament, it's the same word that we get where it's talking about coveting. It's talking about desiring something that you don't have. Deuteronomy chapter 5 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his maidservant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's. He goes on in chapter 7, he says, The carved image of these gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them. Take it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, why does God speak to his people with such strong language? It's an abomination. This idolatry, this desiring something that the, God, that the, that the nations of the world have is an abomination to him. Why? Because there's a direct connection between what, how we see marriage and how we see our relationship with God. There's a connection between committing ourselves to one spouse and committing ourselves to one God. 
And the opposite is true. When we, when we stop seeing God as the singular focus, the one who can satisfy us, the one who, who has our attention, our focus, that's when we begin to be scattered, to begin looking for things of the earth to fill us. Again, we just talked about those. That, that could be misusing food or, or drink or the way we see work, the way we using people around us rather than seeing them as a gift from God. It's when we see God singularly. We love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength that we are able to flesh out that kind of devotion in our relationship with each other. And for those who are here who are married, there's that direct connection between you are God alone, and so I'm serving you alone. And I'm committing my life and oneness to my spouse, laying my life down for you alone. And God is so serious of it that, that the, the essence of this, the reason why, why adultery is so important to God, thinking of this sin, why this sin is so important, is this is the way it's described as the people of God when we turn our hearts to serve the things of the world. God describes it as spiritual adultery. It's how he described the people of Israel as their heart was turned away from the living God, from the one true God. And so we think about the ways in which we live in a world where this temptation is not just something that exists now for these people in this tribe in the Amazon, but how it exists for us, how the temptation exists for us in the world in which we live. So I just want us, again, I want want us to just think about this for where we are right now. And God is so... God is so faithful and loving to let us just open our hearts and examine them right, right here where we are. But think about this, how the internet has affected us. And I don't think we need a statistic to do this, how it has led to adultery for people. That what social media has done is it's allowed us to put a face up, to put a public persona of who we are out. When what the Sermon on the Mount as we go on is going to remind us of that God is most concerned about the hidden things in our lives the things that no one else sees. It's the way he calls us to pray and to give in secret. But what this does is it it actually has produced a, just just, just the, the ability to covet what everybody else has, including other people's relationships. And so you probably know someone who's, I mean, at this point, I, I know multiple people who've left their spouses because they re-engaged with an old boyfriend or girlfriend online. They connected with someone that they, that they saw online, they, they coveted, they desired something that was different than what they had, than who they were in covenant in, and then they pursued that. So the way in this, this emotional infidelity then leads to physical infidelity and faithfulness. We obviously see it in pornography, which again, we don't really even need statistics for, but every statistic that I've read, it's over half of the men in the church. In the church, not just in the world, but in the church, have an active struggle that... of women. So it's not just a man thing, and that's that's why actually in our our follow-up form, we wanted to hold up that this this issue exists for women too, and sometimes it's talked about, pornography addiction is talked about as as kind of a a sin for men only, and it's not true. Even though it affects more of them, and it's true of, again, we have have women in here who have overcome that addiction, and and so we, we, we recognize, we want to feel the weight of that as his people, is that there there maybe existed a period of time when some of us were growing up when you had to go buy a magazine or you had to go rent a video or there was some amount of public shame that maybe you had to endure. In the the, um, times that we read in Scripture, there might have been temple prostitutes that people had to go and visit. The sexual temptation was still there. Again, we say the temptation is universal, but there might have been steps that were involved where you, to give to that temptation, you had to do something that was public. But what has the internet done? It's made it anonymous. It's made it affordable. It's made it available. It's made it something that just with your phone in a moment, you can give in to that temptation. And it's why we see it be just having just wreak, wreaking havoc on relationships. Again, I know this is a heavy topic, but I want us to feel I want us to feel as the people of God the weight of that. David Andre, who leads uh, helps lead our sexual integrity group for men 
and is a licensed counselor. He just said to me one, once, we were in a group, we were talking about it, and he's, he said, yeah, pornography is as addictive as heroin. I remember when he said it, it just like jolted me to think, this is the reality of addiction, is that it becomes something that ensnares people. And you think of how, what it does to our brains is that it causes us to think differently about sex, to think differently about other people. And it becomes a way, again, again, if we're married, that we're sinning against our spouse, but we're also contributing to the sin of the community because we're, we're allowing something that is, you know, we're, we're giving ourselves to an entire industry that is objectifying and taking advantage of people. And this world has this, the, the culture has this way of which we, we're always talking about consent. Like, well, if people just choose to be in that industry, if they're choosing to be in the porn industry, that's them, that's, that's on them, they're making that choice. But do you just understand that people can be abused even in the, when they're in a place of consent? They can be taken advantage of. People that God has made in his image that are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And so it doesn't just, it doesn't just malign our, the way that we're thinking. It doesn't just disrupt our relationships with one another. It's something that pollutes the environment that we live in as people. And so as Jesus talks about it, he talks about it and references twice hell. The, the little word here is Gehenna, and it's, it's this imagery. It was literally a place outside of Jerusalem where garbage was burned. I heard a quote describing it as this, a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. A, qu- a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. And oftentimes when hell is brought up, people want to kind of downplay it. Like, I just don't know if I, I, can, I, don't know if I can think about that, about the reality of judgment. But as we put ourselves as the people of God who want to be conformed into the image of Jesus, as we put ourselves before him today, we want we want to hear Jesus' words. And twice he mentions hell just in these few verses because he wants us to feel the weight of what he's talking about here. The weight of the damage of the sin. It's a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing. Even when we think of the metaphors that are used to describe hell, the reality is far worse than the metaphor because it is a reality of an existence apart from God. I have a quote I want to read read to you. I think they have it on the screen. When you think of our lives being conformed to the image of Christ over and over again, again, what Colossians 1 tells us is this, it's like a spiraling upward more and more towards joy and satisfaction in him. And it culminates in heaven. We get to see him face to face. Jesus comes and he makes all things new. and We don't have to deal with this sinful body, these sinful temptations anymore. But the same is true in the opposite direction. Is that when we give ourselves to the ways of this world, and this is actually when we think of the sin of pornography, it's, it, the, the need increases over and over and over. It, in other words, it has to get more and more perverted, more and more distorted in order to get that hit. It's going further and further into destruction. This is what Joe Rigney says. He's actually describing C.S. Lewis um, the way that he described heaven and hell. Hell is an everlasting ruin a decay. It's crumbling, retreating into yourself. It's a loss of all rationality and joy, a plunging into misery, but it's a self-plunging. It's a gnawing, an ache, but it's oriented inward, downward into the abyss. It is in one sense the opposite of heaven. Heaven is this ever-increasing further up, further into the joy of God, into life, Hell is the opposite of that. It's an everlasting movement away from God. 
And so Jesus is talking about hell to stir us to, cre- to action. It's to create urgency in us. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body is thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. I was reminded of a story, you guys might remember this, from 2003. It's been a while ago. It was this hiker by the name of Aaron Ralston. He ended up writing a book about it, and there was a movie about his life. But he was in a canyon in Utah, and he was climbing, and a boulder fell on his wrist. Do you guys remember this story? I was describing to my kids this weekend about how I got cut and working in high school and I had to have six stitches in my finger and they were asking me to detail it to them and my whole body was like tense trying to tell them about how I had to get six stitches and I'm just letting you know ahead of time this was far worse so he's there for five days and he realizes if something doesn't change he's gonna die and so with the own force of his body he breaks his arm And then he uses what he described as a very dull pocket knife to cut off his arm. And if you see the picture of him, you see his prosthetic arm. I mean, he loses his arm. And you think, how could someone do that? How could someone have what it would take, the kind of mental determination to take a pocket knife and cut off your arm? And the answer is, when you know that if you don't do that, you're going to die. That is the weight that Jesus puts behind this passage. He says that if there is sin that is stirring in you, it might feel small. It might not even have physical actions like adultery, but it is lust that is growing in you. You're to do whatever you have to do to cut that off because that will be a downward cycle into death. It's to hell. And Jesus gives us an invitation to life. It's a putting to death. John Owen said this famously. He said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. His whole book on the mortification of sin is based on this one verse in Romans 8.13 For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You have to put to death the misdeeds of the body. It's not about mutilation. Again, this is a hyperbole. It's not, Jesus is not talking about actually hurting our bodies. It's not about mutilation. It's about mortification. It's a putting to death. Mortification means you're you're putting something to death. You're not feeding that part of your flesh that keeps wanting more and more and more. And so what does that look like practically? Can we just get, I just want to give you a few things, and then we're going to go to the cross together, and we're going to sing a song of surrender. A few things if you think, what does it look like for me to not feed my flesh, but to put it to death? The first is that we separate ourselves from the area of temptation and sin. We just separate ourselves from it. So that for some people might be, you know, you have to figure out more rules around your phone or around when you're in front of screen, or you've got to move your computer to a different part of the house, or you've got to figure out a different way. I mean, you know, to think about people who've, who've given themselves to actually infidelity with a person, that many times those connections are people at work. I know people who have changed jobs because they knew that was an area of temptation with another person. Changed jobs because they, they did whatever it took because they realized, I have a job that puts me in front of a computer all the time you know, without fail, and they just realize, I, if, I, if I don't get out of this sin, it's going to lead me to death. You do whatever you have to do. We talked about couples outside of sex just struggling with keeping themselves pure. Couples that, and there, there's couples in here that are now married that were living together once and moved out. There's couples that I know who, who decided, I will not, I will, we will just not be in the, we will only be together when we're in public. 
because the temptation is too great. We're just taking out, we're just taking away all, yes, everybody else has these freedoms. That's great that they have those freedoms, but I'm eliminating that freedom because I have to cut that off because I know it is leading me to a place of death, to sin. And this is where when we talk about our conversation with each other, and this might be a really deep conversation to have around a hot dog today. But the reality is, it should be what the church is about. To be able to say, hey, if you've struggled in this way, what, is this, what, is it, what does it look like for you to gain victory in life? What does it mean for you to have to have cut something off from your life in order to separate yourself from that temptation? So the first is separation. The second thing is confession. We just bring to light what's hidden in darkness. I remember the first time when I learned the power of confession. I was 18 years old. And honestly, it was terrifying. And then on the other side was the most exhilarating jolt of the power of God. I, I, I had rarely experienced that up until that point in my life of what the enemy does and lies to you and says, if you bring this out in the open, this person's going to think of you less. They're, going to, they're, they're not going to see you as highly. And you just, you, the enemy will give you every single lie as to why you need to keep it quiet. And when you bring it into light, there is just power and there is transformation, there's healing that happens. So we separate us, so ourselves from the sin. We confess our sins one to another that we might be healed. And the third thing I want to give you is we discipline ourselves. We discipline our flesh. Jesus is going to tell us later, he's going to say, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, because the expectation is, as the people of God, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to starve our flesh. So if you're in a place where you're battling with your flesh, it might seem unrelated to you, but even going without food for a meal or for a day or for multiple days and saying to your body, I don't live by bread alone, but I live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He is the one that sustains me. That discipline in one area actually strengthens you to be disciplined in another area. And you, so you say, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to discipline my mind and body in this one area because I want to be disciplined in this area where I have experienced incredible failure and temptation. We discipline ourselves. Irene, if you want to come, um, as we prepare for our ministry time, do you think of putting to death what's in us? We separate ourselves. We cut it off. We confess to one another, which... You can do today, you might, you might just, I would encourage you if, you, if you have something that you need to bring to light today, if it doesn't happen today, you need to write down the person and the time and the place in which this thing that was hidden will come to light. And I promise you, I've said this before, but I just can't say enough. There is nothing that you would bring to light that hasn't been experienced by someone else in this room, more than likely multiple people. Whether it be a way that you have failed or it might be a way of which other, someone else has sinned against you. And you might think, this is the darkest, this is the most evil, this is the most awful thing, and I promise you, there are not only people who have walked through that, but there are people who have experienced incredible healing on the other side of that. It's why our confession is not just to Jesus alone. Our confession is one to another that we might be healed. And so I want to give you an encouragement with that as we go to Jesus together. In fact, why don't you just, why don't you stand? And if you guys could, if, um, Gretchen, if you want to just go ahead and bring down the lights, just, I want everybody to just have a moment of focus. Because I realize this is a heavy, it's a heavy topic. It's something that, again, we can it's very easy for the enemy to lie to us and we respond from a place of sh in a place of shame. But the scripture tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's not, there's no condemnation for those who think things or th show up at a church service. It's there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who are in union with him, in covenant with him. And so the reason why marriage is so important is marriage in this life is so important is because it points to the greater marriage. It points to the marriage between Christ and his church. 
But here's what I want you to, here's what I want to hold up to you if you need the, if you need the truth and the hope of the good news of Jesus to propel you to a place of getting healing and victory in life. And some of you may have experienced this in your own marriage, is that when we become one with each other, all of that person gets joined to us. And so some of you experienced getting debt joined to you. Like you got married and your spouse had a bunch of school debt. And guess what that became? Your debt, didn't it? Some of you experienced the opposite. Like you got married and your spouse had rich grandparents. And there's this incredible inheritance for them. What happens when you become one with them? All of that inheritance becomes yours because two have become one. It's exactly what that is in Jesus. But here's, here's what the exchange looks like. The debt of our sin and our failure and our weight, he takes. And what he gives us is the inheritance of righteousness, of belonging to him forever. That is the reality of being in Christ. And it's from in that place that we can say confidently, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so would you just bow, just close your eyes, bow your heads. Just want you to give just a moment just before Jesus. This is not something I normally do in leading in response time, but I just, I feel that it's really important that there's an opportunity for there to be some type of physical response right now. If the Lord is, at, is, is, he's putting on your heart something that you have to do in response to what you've heard. And if you know what that is, I just want to invite you all, people's heads bowed, their eyes closed, just before God, I want you to just lift your hand as a way of saying to the Lord, I know what that is. And if you don't know, don't, don't do that. But as a way of saying, I know what step I need to take. It might be now, it might be a week from now. But I know that there is a step that I need to take. And as a sign of surrender to him, that you would just lift your hand to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Lord, for life in you, new life in you. We just pray for healing today for people who are bound in sin, healing for marriages that are, are broken. God, we pray for your healing power. We pray that today would be a day of salvation for some to come from being apart from you to surrendering to you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for giving us this time as your family. Thank you for giving us this time to just begin a healing work. Lord, we pray for your purifying work among us as a people. Purify us. Purify our minds. Purify our hearts. Purify our motives. Purify our actions, God. We want to reflect you. We want to look like you. We want to display your glory in the world.